Welcome to Building a Better Resource. My name is Dan Hansen. Jesse Carlsberg. Um, we're going to talk today about uh, improving a Drupal Scholarly Journal platform, specifically the southernspaces.org site uh, that we worked in tandem to build out and refresh uh, from a Drupal 6 to a Drupal 7 site. Um, I'm Dan Hansen of Savag Group Inc. Uh, I'm the lead developer at Savag Group and I've been involved in the Drupal community for about five years, give or take. Um, I've presented at uh, Drupal Camp Atlanta before, uh, hoping maybe this session will get me all the way to uh, DrupalCon, but uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. I like short walks on the beach, good food. Um, I've got a website you can reach at that link there. Not a lot of updates, but definitely something you can check out if you like, uh, or you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, and I'm Jesse Carlsberg. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Emory Center for Digital Scholarship, um, working on various publishing projects uh, in what we call the digital humanities these days in academia. Um, so I'm the consulting editor of Southern Spaces. I've worked with the journal um, since 2011 in varying, various roles as the managing editor for much of the last two years when we were doing the bulk of the um, work on this redesign project. Um, and uh, I've been, been employed um, in higher ed uh, doing digital scholarship work and also before that uh, in IT for a while, since about 2003. Um, started off in the IT department at Harvard Divinity School, um, did a little work at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and then um, as a graduate student have worked in the, um, and now as a postdoctoral fellow, I've worked in the Center for Digital Scholarship at Emory. Um, and I noticed that Dan and I have the same uh, WordPress theme. For our personal <laughs> websites. Which is to say it's the basic WordPress theme. The Don't tell anyone here it's supposed it's, to be a Drupal camp. Yeah. Don't let anyone. Don't look know. at our websites. Don't look at our websites. Yeah, it's just uh, the twenty. The, the it's a recent basic. Drupal yeah. Thing, so it's not old. <laughs> exactly. Anyway. Yeah. Didn't notice that. All right. So let's actually dig in and uh, take a look at the two sites, uh, the old version and the new version. Uh, I've got them both pulled up here. This was the old existing version of the site. Um, you'll notice that the images aren't showing up uh, for some of these listings. That's because. Uh, they're views based and are uh, trying to reach out to a server that no longer has them. Uh, so ignore that part. Mm -hmm. um, but you can see it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we've got a column down the left side for your navigation, a uh, big tag cloud down at the bottom for your tags, uh, blog posts and featured items are separated on here. Um, recently published items, easily accessible, uh, new reviews, uh, reviews being a, a, a different type of content, um, but still within the same content type. Um, easy access to links across the top. Nothing was really bad about the site, but it definitely needed a refresh. This was something that definitely wasn't mobile geared. Um, you know, had this uh, single static column. Uh, if you looked at a specific element of the site, a specific journal post, um, you could see it's uh, very cut and dry. Um, anything you wanted to add on, on the older site? I think you hit on some of the major points. Yeah, really wanting to, um, to, to have a responsive design that would display well on, on, on mobile and tablet. Um, and also just feeling like, even though the, the site still looked OK, um, that the conventions of design in the broader world of media on the web change really quickly. And we wanted our journal to, be, uh, to, have, a, to have a nice, fresh, new look. So lots of excitement there. And then we came into this new site. Uh, the new site is sort of based around the concept of uh, letting you have it with the content that we want you to see immediately <clears throat> and upfront. So we've got a, a lovely rotator up here. Uh, <laughs> we, we've got the most recently published content uh, available uh, from the top down. This is an infinite scroll here. Um, so you can just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and get content all day long, um, back and back and back. Uh, we've got a lovely little header that sort of slides out of the way, which is very useful when it comes to mobile. Um, and speaking of, you can see that the site itself is actually responsive. Um, this is actually the Masonry JS plugin that's driving the collapse of all this uh, material beneath the top. But you can see how it'll winnow down from three columns to just one uh, and give you the same amount of content as well as the same slider at the top. Uh, navigation's available up at the top as well. Um, you've got little drawers that pop out. Uh, try to keep it from being mystery meat. We've got these labeled so you can browse over here, uh, see the main menu over here. And drilling down into the browse section, you can actually see 
uh, individual pieces or individual types of publications that are offered, as well as organization uh, for those pieces by author, of which there are many, <laughs> um, or by year, uh, all, all sorts of different variations on how to sort of peruse the content and find what, if anything, you're, you're looking for. Um, let's take a look at an actual piece of content. Um, we added a lovely sort of uh, main graphic to the top of a lot of these articles uh, that sort of serves to draw the user in. Um, once you scroll down, that sort of slides up and out of the way and gives you access to uh, the article itself. Um, similar sort of format in that we have you know, just a main column of, of text. Uh, one of the big changes is that we've added the sections menu to the side, whereas the sections before would just appear up at the top. Uh, this is persistent and available at all times, so you could click and go to a specific section and take a look at uh, specific parts of the article, which is great because these are very long form articles uh, for uh, the journal format. Um, lovely additions at the bottom as well. Uh, a lot of recommended resources. Uh, similar publications was something that was added in uh, to, to give more click through to other portions of the site. Um, we've got the footnotes here as well. And I feel like there's another component, but I can't remember what it was off the top of my the head. The tag I think, cloud and the Creative Commons, I guess. Or the, yeah. um, the tags and the Creative Commons, yeah. but that's... Okay. More uh, more anything you wanted to add on that? I think... Uh, oh, this was lovely yeah. too. We also added the uh, hover effect for the um, footnotes, so that instead of having to click it and jump all over the page, uh, as you have to with the automated footnotes, you kind of just get it right there. Yeah, so that's so. that's kind of where where we started and where we came to. <coughs> I'm gonna hop back in here. Great. So uh, Dan's already talked a little bit, and we both talked a bit about what our goals were. Um, on a very basic level, um, we we knew that we needed to um, to migrate to Drupal seven. The, our our journal was founded eleven years ago as a static site. Our staff hand-coded pages in Dreamweaver um, a little bit where they were able, but mostly used the WYSIWYG editor, and it was a real mess. Um, we moved over to Drupal 6 in 2010 uh, with the site that you just saw. Um, we uh, we want to keep using Drupal. Part of our, our, our site's whole reason for existing is in the scholarly publishing space, um, most articles are, are just text. There's, there may be a couple of images, but there's just text, and that fits in a book pretty well, but since um, since, scholar, since scholarly publishing has moved to the web, there's been a lot of opportunities that most journals have not taken up. So um, from the beginning, our journal was committed to multimedia. It was committed to including things like video and audio and also having the capacity to do other, other sorts of um, uh, things in addition to text and image that might accompany a piece and help a, an, a, an author make an argument. Um, so Drupal for us was, was a way to make that possible um, for our staff that doesn't necessarily have a whole lot of, uh, of technical aptitude or training. Mm -hmm. um, so wanting to, to be able to, um, to keep doing that going forward, we, we felt like we needed to move to Drupal 7. Um, I already talked a little bit about um, wanting to, to have go with that um, a responsive design, wanting to have a cleaner look. Um, <coughs> being, on, being a scholarly uh, publishing outlet on the web isn't just about following technological changes, it's also about looking current. Um, if you're on the web, then people are going to be comparing your site, not with other uh, dry journals in print, but with, I don't know, uh, long, the form Atlant content long form that content, the Atlantic yeah. or, or Vanity Fair or things like that, it's, uh, Garden and Gun. <laughs> uh, yeah, there, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, news outlets that definitely do uh, long form content in a That's lot right. of exciting ways that we kind of wanted to try to capture. Exactly. Um, and. Uh, uh, we've also, you know, part of our, our whole motivation in doing multimedia publishing is to say to the rest of the scholarly publishing field that this is something you need to be thinking about. Um, that just because some of your authors may not need video clips to, um, to, to make their scholarly arguments doesn't mean that they shouldn't have the opportunity to include video clips. And if you look at how, again, the web has changed old print publications and other spaces like newspapers and magazines, they've all embraced a, a wide range of opportunities that scholarly publishing by and large has not. Um, so for us to, uh, to make this point um, to the larger scholarly publishing community, 
a piece of that needs to be creating a way for what, what we do to be replicated. So another major goal um, for the project was to create a standardized platform, basically, that other journals could use. And because we're, we're using Drupal, uh, distribution is sort of the, the direction we're leaning to that's kind of still in progress, but uh, definitely uh, an exciting portion of Drupal that we're going to leverage to make that happen. So major project components, uh, this is kind of going over how we accomplished the transition from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7. Uh, migration, obviously key, uh, want to get the content over uh, as complete as possible with uh, all the images intact, all the media, all the multimedia intact. Uh, we wanted to remove unnecessary <laughs> functionality. Um, there was a lot. Uh, <laughs> we'll go over some more of that in a moment. Uh, we. We had goals to add new and useful features. Um, there's a lot of things that uh, we could do to make things easier during the process of creation of uh, these journal uh, pieces. And then ultimately we wanted to create the distribution. So we're moving from D6 to D7, should be pretty easy, right? Uh, if you've ever used Migrate, there's even a lovely little module, sub-module that does just D6 to D7. Um, that of course is never Never exactly the case. It's never that simple or straightforward. Uh, we ran into several challenges during the migration. Uh, for, for instance, uh, combining, the, combining the blog post content type and the main article content type. Um, not a huge struggle here, but there was a separate content type outside of the article content type that uh, was being used just for our uh, blog posts. Um, a lot of the same content and then some fields that just diverged wildly. Uh, we wanted to bring that into the same sort of central location, the same uh, main content type, so that any sort of overview or uh, any sort of code that we implemented on one, we wouldn't have to duplicate and had to throw onto the other. Um, also, uh, the, the process and workflow that we're trying to implement on the site, we wanted to make sure that that carried over for both the blog posts as well as the main article content type. Another big migration challenge was the original author setup in the site was actually using taxonomy terms. Um, and we wanted to better incorporate the authors into the system. So we wanted to take those uh, taxonomy terms and turn them into users. Uh, you'll see here, we've got a, a lovely long four or 500 record sheet of uh, all the different users. This was shared for <laughs> several months, I think, between the two of us, just refining this data over and over and over again, making sure we had uh, proper email addresses, points of contacts. Uh, it's actually written into the migration. Uh, uh, Google Docs has a lovely API where you can uh, reach out and grab data straight from the sheet. Um, so whenever this got revised, I could re-migrate the data and get updated data almost real time. Um, but yeah, that was uh, an interesting and extended process. Of, of moving them from taxonomy terms to users. And then one of the biggest challenges was all the multimedia assets. Uh, we had several images. Images are pretty straightforward. Uh, if they're in the file system, perfect, because Migrate mm. does uh, file transitions excellently. They're not always in the file system, though. Sometimes you have just one-off links that are pulling from another source or uh, didn't quite get uploaded the same way as anything else. So we had to parse the content to find those links, uh, bring them into the new file system. So that was an experience. And then we had the video and audio. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more later um, because we've actually, while we tried to pull over some of that content, uh, ultimately we transitioned to more of a cloud hosted solution and uh, took the video and audio out of the, the site specifically and uh, sort of offloaded it to third party providers. But we'll, like I said, we'll get, we'll get to that a little bit more later on. Cleaning up. Um, we did a extended discovery period on the site, uh, just trying to um, cross our T's, uh, dot our I's, um, P's and Q's, alphabet soup, really. Uh, <laughs> ran into a lot of extra no longer used modules. Uh, one of the big components was an old e-journal uh, installation yeah. that you guys used some components of, but not nearly the breadth of, of, of everything it could do. So that got nixed almost immediately. We also had uh, a lot of workflow modules that were uh, attempted to be used. Um, and then I think I saw 
at least one module that was uh, an attempt to use a WordPress style content editing system. Um, and then there were a handful of modules that weren't even on, uh, weren't even for Drupal 6. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there was a lot to clean up. We, we parsed a lot out of it. Um, another exciting thing that we found out uh, pretty early on was that southernspaces.org is actually a multi-site installation uh, along with another journal. Um, we had a, a couple rounds with the uh, library team that was hosting it, uh, trying to figure out, you know, are we maintaining this old site? Is it going to need to stay live? Uh, what are we doing to separate these two sites? Uh, so we, we ended up figuring that out. It, uh, uh, Southern Spaces actually moved to, again, more of a cloud uh, hosting solution. Uh, we're using AWS to, to host it now. And then uh, moved assets away from the Emory library hosting. Um, again, that's uh, sort of pushing them out to the cloud. Yeah, and so I, I was going to say just a little bit about uh, those uh, the, that decision making process. Um, our our uh, our Drupal six journal um, was hosted on just a box that lived a floor down from us somewhere in the library, um, and we uh, served video using JW Player, um, also hosted within the library, um, and also used that for audio. Uh, and so one one uh, a component of our decision to move towards a, a, a more cloud-hosted environment was ease of managing the assets. Um, our staff, in order to, uh, to to prepare video files for hosting, had to um, both format them in a very specific way and then use an FTP client to upload them to a streaming server and then create two different XML files. Um, in the case of video playlists, it was a, it was a process that you know, would be easy to handle if you were comfortable with all of these technologies and tools, um, but that actually required a, a bit of an investment of time in staff training and then retraining um, because the, the can, you know, try to share these responsibilities around and then over time people forget and you have to teach them again. Um, so in, in contrast with that, uh, a service like Vimeo, which we wound up moving to for video, um, was extraordinarily simple, uh, a lot easier for us to envision using um, with our staff for training purposes. So um, that kind of, that, the way, that, that sense in which it's just easier to deal with a lot of these different types of media we're using was one motivation for that process. Um, another thing is, is a lot of these tools simplify the processes of making changes. So for audio, for video, um, Vimeo has this nice capacity to just upload a new file in place of an old one. Um, we can easily make changes to the, um, the title or description of a video, do things that, again, used to, used to involve um, downloading and editing a couple of XML files. Um, and even the, the process of making changes to the site itself. Um, we, we, Emory does offer um, to various uh, units at, in, the, in the university uh, its own shared hosting environment, um, which we looked at um, and actually do use in our center for a number of things. But in this case, uh, it just really felt like AWS um, was a better fit, um, in part because it gave us, within the unit of Emory that we're housed in, um, a lot more direct control over the site. And Southern Spaces, unlike a lot of Emory websites which might just use the standard um, terrible content management system <laughs> called Cascade uh, that Emory uses. Sorry, I said that publicly. It's terrible. <laughs> it's, um, it's recorded now. It's terrible, <laughs> yes. So um, you're saying that you're using Vimeo as the player and uh, AWS to store the assets. But where did you keep the metadata? Was it in Vimeo or was it in Drupal? Metadata for the for the video files. Um, so I guess you would say that it's in Vimeo. Um, we we we. What we do is is uh, on Vimeo we have people can go to Vimeo and they can browse you know several hundred videos that we have and they there have a title, a description, some tags, things of that nature to basically uh, make it possible to browse them on Vimeo and have a way to interact with our content through Vimeo. On our site they're embedded. Um, typically in one of these standard content types that represents our articles, our reviews, and what have you, and there's just a caption beneath it. Um, and rather than use, you know, you can get from Vimeo a kind of standard made caption and just the embed code, um, but it works better for us to, 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 to just author our own caption, and that's essentially the, the way that we approach that. Yeah, it's, it's just it's, copy and paste yeah. embed code. And, you know, to be, and, and honestly, um, that's easy. You know, that's easy for our staff to do. Um, so we, we looked at integration in a more kind of 
uh, involved way, but at the, at the moment decided not to do that. Um, yeah, the, and the last thing I think that's, that's an important consideration there is that there's a real potential for cost reduction in moving towards cloud hosting. Um, in particular with something like audio or video where we're trying to stand up our own server and, and even across the whole university, maybe 80% of that use was our journal. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense for us to do all of that work of maintaining the server. Um, so by moving to something like Vimeo, we can have a, a really inexpensive account even when we're using their main account. Um, and I think that there's, there's great potential there um, in, uh, in moving to AWS as well. And so this is something that I think you see a lot in uh, higher education um, is that, that universities, especially large universities like Emory, they're going to maintain, we're going to maintain our own servers. We're going to have um, uh, some uh, servers that are somewhere on campus that a lot of people are responsible for. But pre people are moving, on the one hand, away from each unit having their own servers and towards that. But then also, I think, from a service like that for certain use cases, especially those um, that, like this journal, require a great deal of customization to cloud servers. All right, so uh, as I said before, we wanted to add new useful features now that we've kind of taken out the, the features that are no longer being used. Um, so what's really useful to people creating and edit editing scholarly journal content? Uh, the biggest focus we had was on ease of use. And that meant a lot of things, uh, starting with uh, reducing the number of fields being used. For example, on the old site for the articles, uh, we had two separate fields for the title. Uh, one was a formatted title, one was an unformatted title that could be used in uh, views and things like that across the site and searches. Um, we winnowed that down to one, made it so that that one formatted title can automatically generate the unformatted title if needed. Uh, another set of fields that we sort of winnowed down was the publish date. Uh, mm -hmm. We were tracking not only the publish date, but also the publish year separately, um, so that that could be used as a taxonomy. Um, Narrowed that down, uh, just set up the view to organize based on that year, and uh, you know just bring down the number of fields that are actually something that needs to be interacted with. Upgrading the WYSIWYG. Uh, they were using Tiny MCE. Nothing wrong with Tiny MCE, old standard. Uh, Drupal as a community, though, uh, especially with Drupal 8, is moving towards CK Editor. CK Editor is actually in Drupal 8 by default. Hmm. Um, so we, we made a push to change over from tiny MCE to uh, CK editor. Um, and then we also needed to provide templates as needed. This kind of went with the transition between tiny MCE and CK editor. Uh, you guys had a lot of features that you were using and we wanted to make, and we wanted to make sure that all of those features stayed consistent. Uh, that included uh, the WYSIWYG templates that were being used. Uh, you guys used them largely to organize and lay out uh, graphics on the page and uh, put captions on, on things in a consistent fashion. Um, using WYSIWYG template allows us to uh, basically create a framework to put uh, captions in a, in a consistent fashion across the site um, in a reusable way. Um, some other things that we added were actually in the form of modules. Um, and these modules are actually sandboxed, and I'm, I'm going to demonstrate some of them real quick. Uh, we built out a text sections module and a juice box inline module, and I'll demonstrate those. Um, if uh, anybody has not had the opportunity to use uh, VDD, uh, which is the Vagrant box that lets you set up a local uh, Drupal environment, by all means, give it a shot. It's lovely, <laughs> uh, and made this demo happened in about two hours, which was great. Uh, this is a very rudimentary, very rudimentary, rudimentary, rudimentary uh, <laughs> implementation of Drupal 7. A it's word just, like rudimentary should be really a lot yeah. easier to say. If you simple. Think about it. it should, it be, should simple. be simple. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I've just got a handful of modules attached to this outside of the um, the core functionality. Uh, I've got CK Editor. I've got IMCE just to be able to add images. Um, and I've also got the text sections module and the juice box inline module. Uh, and let me show you real quick what those do. Uh, here we have just a, a sample piece of content. Uh, you know, it's got a couple headlines, um, and then it's got a couple images. Well, the images, we definitely, they're, they're too big, and we want to make them into a gallery. So what we'll do is hop into the content. I've got CK Editor here, um, and I will wrap it in 
these juice box tags. And Juicebox, if you don't already know, is actually a, a pretty widely used JavaScript-based gallery. Uh, it's got an implementation in Drupal already, but to use it, you actually have to build a view around a set of images. Well, we wanted to make it so that you guys could just drop in a gallery wherever you wanted, uh, so long as you had the images uh, uploaded to the site already. So we have this tag. <coughs> Excuse me. Save the site, and all of a sudden, those images are now in a juice box gallery. Uh, the lovely thing about that is um, this skips sort of the step of creating the XML backend file that you would need to build, uh, which is something obviously we were trying to move away from when we <laughs> moved away from JW Player. Um, the other thing we added was text sections. Uh, you notice on the old site, we had these sections, and on the new site, uh, we, we've got similar sections, but uh, not in the same place. And, and we wanted to be able to move those around if we could and basically generate them on the fly. Um, if you're familiar with Microsoft Word, if you're familiar with mm. uh, Google Docs, they have this sort of outlining capability that lets you take headlines and turn them into uh, just a listing for a table of contents, something along those lines. That's the functionality we wanted to bring into Drupal. And we actually were successful in doing that. So uh, if you come in here and edit the content, you can see we have a sections field here. And you give it a, a sections type. You have a, a manually input sections if you want to. And just give it a, a title here. And then the anchor slug that will let you jump to that specific section. Um, and then you would implement those anchor slugs within the content itself. Uh, but the lovely thing that we did was automatically generate sections. Um, and then you can provide the depth. And we've actually got a H, uh, I think it's an H1, H2, and then an H1 again. Um, so you could automatically generate based on those. Say save. Yep. And of course, I blanked out my own title, so. <laughs> wow. This one's there's, there's a reason these are still sandbox, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll save that. And you can see, hmm. not only did we generate sections, but we were able to generate them into a block format that we could stick anywhere on the page that hmm. we want. So bringing functionality from places that people already know or are experienced with, uh, making it easy to do in Drupal, that's kind of the whole idea of Drupal, really, so that we got to be able to do this for a scholarly journal project is actually really exciting. Hop back into the presentation here. All right. Hmm. Uh, so an another thing that was, was kind of a, a component of, of, uh, of what we were hoping to add to um, what, what we could do with Drupal on our new site is to represent our actual uh, submission review process. Um, and I'm not going to probably bore you with our entire submission review process because it's fairly involved. Um, but suffice to say, uh, we, we had hoped to, to do this with our, our older Drupal site, uh, and the system that we had just didn't have the flexibility nor the nuance to capture what we were doing. Um, so we moved over to using Trello, um, where we just have a whole bunch of different lists that represent, you know, um, a piece is submitted, it goes through internal review. The internal review goes to the senior editor who sends it back to the author, and the author revises and resubmits, and then it goes through internal review again, and then it maybe goes to peer review, and then it goes from peer review back to the author, and so on and so forth. Um, this could be different for um, what's essentially the same content type in Drupal, but on our side might be an article versus a review, which have different standards for the kind of review. And this is very common um, in the scholarly publishing space, that there's very specific um, criteria and processes for review. So our hope was to, to find a way to capture that in Drupal. And while mm -hmm. we have not gotten 100% there, uh, the, we're working on bringing that workflow into the site completely. Um, that's kind of the partial goal of bringing the authors into the site as users as opposed to uh, um, just a taxonomy. Um, we talked a little bit before about the e-journal implementation that was present previously. Uh, that was like you said, not uh, meeting the needs that you guys were after. Um, if you've worked with this sort of workflow problem before, obviously you're going to envision the workflow module. 
That was a direction we tried to go initially, but ultimately having worked with workflow before, uh, you don't get the flexibility you really want. Um, say if, for example, you want a, a step in the process to change name when you go from uh, one position in the workflow to another position in the workflow, uh, that can be a, a nightmare to put together. So uh, we investigated our options. We actually looked into uh, several and one that we came up with was Maestro. Uh, Maestro is actually uh, Drupal 7 only at the moment. I think they're working on a Drupal 8 version, but essentially it's a, a graphical version of a workflow. Um, and I'll show you what I mean by that. It allows you to essentially make a flowchart mm -hmm. version of your workflow um, and then define each one of those components separately as a, a different action or different uh, value change. Um, it's not the easiest thing to work with, but it, it provides a flexibility that lets you uh, change the workflow as needed, which was something that was very big on, uh, uh, on putting this together. So you, you can see uh, the workflow gets a bit complex just due to the nature <laughs> of, uh, of pulling uh, you know, a, a dozen or so Trello cards over. Down here at the bottom, this is the final checklist that mm -hmm. actually goes into uh, uh, bringing a piece to uh, publication. Most of these are actually layout tasks. Um, but ultimately, it's all very flexible, uh, very much something that uh, can be put together into an extensible workflow. Just that, is Maestro, can you generate any kind of reports from that? Status reports, things like that? Reporting is a little bit trickier. Um, you can get a report based on what status each item is in. Uh, but beyond that, I don't, I don't think it's, it, it delivers reports past that. Um, I mean, it, it's bottom line is it's all data. You could probably make the reports, um, and I think it's got some views integration to to make that a little bit easier. And as I said, that's an ongoing implementation that we're continuing to work on, and and hopefully get that uh, complete and in place. Um, one of the other components that we wanted to work on is uh, simplifying the data input, and what I mean by that is when you go to produce something uh, as complex as a scholarly journal piece online, uh, you have the capability to deliver it to a lot of different places using a lot of different metadata. Um, so what we try to do is winnow down the pipeline of how much data needed to be enter entered and how many times it needed to be, how many times it needed to be entered. Um, so the creating the, uh, the node on the site uh, for an article or something along those lines will actually also generate a biblio node alongside it with all the fields pre-populated. The biblio node in turn can feed schema.org uh, implementation, it can feed Google Scholar implementation. Uh, just about any met metadata needs that we have can actually be fed off of the biblio node that we're generating alongside the, the main node. And the reason we sort of separated it out like that was to make it as straightforward as possible to create the piece that you want to create, and then uh, Biblio will, will sort of take care and handle the rest of, of, of the, the work. Um, another component that we're uh, working on implementing is actually digital object identifiers. These are kind of permalinks for uh, the entire internet. Um, they're just little identifiers that let you uh, change the metadata on the back end and be able to access the same piece of content uh, no matter where you access the digital object identifier. Um, it's very useful when it comes to putting together data for uh, who's looking at a piece of content. Uh, Altmetrics is actually looking to condense all of those metrics, you know, Facebook, Twitter, uh, among uh, the, the more widely known ones, but also uh, Google Scholar uh, trying to get data from uh, other scholarly journals that are pulling things together. Um, these digital object identifiers are what we're using to uh, pull all that data together. It's also a component of Biblio. Uh, Biblio tracks those for us as well. Um, so th those are a component that we're using to uh, sort of make things easier to deliver that data across the internet. I'm working on a uh, project right now. I want people to have a standard DOI thing that you can mm. plug your provider into. Mm. And there was a lot of interest in Drupal on LA. Um, and the DOI seems to be very popular amongst government 
yeah. documentation mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. which is one of the big things I'm doing. Mm. Um, do you, do you write your own, just adapt it? Cool we're still working on it, actually. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> so we're kind of in the midst of, of writing our own, actually. Except for our own. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Is this yours, I think? I think so, yeah. Yeah, so uh, talking uh, a little bit about our, our aim going forward and this idea of creating a distribution um, so that we could share what we're doing with other journals. Um, I touched on this at the beginning, but... Um, you know, Drupal is really underutilized in the scholarly journal space. Um, most people who publish scholarly journals use one of a few different systems that are built by um, university IT departments in conjunction with something like a digital scholarship center. There's a tool called Open Journal Systems um, that a lot of people use. Um, and these systems are not very customizable. They're nothing like a full-featured CMS like Drupal. Um, so they're limiting. Uh, typically, you're stuck to a PDF or just um, basically plain or text with plain text or text with very limited formatting. Uh, integration of things like multimedia happens as associated files. It can't be laid out in the flow of content. So we think that Drupal uh, is, a, is a CMS that, that should be taken up all across scholarly journal publishing. Um, but at the, at the moment, it's, it really isn't very widely used yet. We do not. Um, our journal is digital only. Um, and so that's a good question. You know, for, for, and and a, a number of journals now are um, print and then PDF online, <coughs> but a lot of new journals in particular are not having print versions, um, and I think we're seeing more and more of that. Um, another, another thing which I thought I would throw out there is that um, you know, we had to spend money to have our site redesigned, and a part of justifying that to our university um, was the idea that making the distribution accessible um, would give our institution presence uh, in the space of scholarly journal publishing. Um, so this is, uh, uh, was, was useful to, to us, and it's been important for, for, to us from the beginning to have our journal be kind of a, a, a symbol of what one could do with digital scholarly publishing. Um, but it's also something maybe for anyone who's hoping to work with, um, with university clients to think about uh, is that, that there's added value beyond the redesigned journal. Um, that you can offer. And one way that you can do that is to say, look, this is something that you can use, but it's also something that your institution could trumpet as a tool that others could adopt. And for us, that was a big part of justifying um, going through this whole redevelopment process. It's great to bring our journal into this new um, Drupal 7 environment with a nice new design, but it's also great for our center and great for our division um, of Emory that we have the potential to, to, to share it with others. And I'll, I'll talk just a little bit about what it's going to, uh, what's going to go into creating that distribution. Um, it is something that we're still in progress on, so um, it, it's sort of broad strokes at this point. Uh, one of the basics is retargeting, retargeting components from specific to uh, generalized use. Um, as you mentioned, for example, uh, we uh, are not working with a published version of the site uh, currently. The, the journal isn't published anywhere, but uh, obviously, there are still going to be journals out there that will, so we want to make this uh, distribution accessible to those people as well. Um, just a, a lot of details that we put time into cre creating for uh, SouthernSpaces.org kind of need to be rolled back or at least tapered a little bit just to make it accessible to a lot broader base of users. Cleaning up the code base, um, you know, those modules are still sandboxed, so we want to get those uh, all uh, standardized for the Drupal code uh, code base. And then find ways to retain small but important reusable features. Usually mm -hmm. this comes in the format of uh, building out small modules, um, like the ones for text sections and things like that. Uh, just things that will uh, set the distribution apart a little bit um, and, and make it uh, more valuable to people that are, are building in the scholarly journal space. Um, and as I said, that's ongoing. And I think that's about uh, it. That covers just about everything we were looking to cover. Um, are there any questions out there? Is your, um, I mean, I have, I, I have really looked at, are there other uh, publishing distributions? The biggest publishing distribution currently is Open Publish. It has not been updated in quite some time. Um, and in fact, if you try to access it on Drupal.org, you get this lovely warning about how a lot of these modules are out of date. Um, it's still valuable. Uh, but it's also not focused specifically on scholarly journal publishing, which was why we didn't try to extend it or build on that. Um, we really wanted something that was focused on uh, getting scholarly journal materials out there. Yes. 
<laughs> what was your sequence of uh, you know, work? Like, uh, how did you go from A to B? Like, what the intermediate steps you took in what order? Uh, to, to do, do what? This migration. Like, going from six to seven. Did you do the modeling first? Did you do the theme first? And how did you do uh, hmm. We did some high level modeling. Uh, the theme wasn't really a part of the migration. The theme was sort of uh, developed in parallel with the migration. Um, uh, basically, I went in, uh, took a look at the content types that were already existing on the site, I evaluated those, looked for pieces that were repetitive, things that needed to be changed, altered uh, to make them easier to use and then implemented those content types on the new site. Um, from there, you could sort of uh, take the data that's established in the old site, uh, tweak it in the migration itself, um, and then deliver it into the new content types. Um, we were able to leverage a lot of pretty default functionality because it was going from six to seven, so there's no wild uh, changes in uh, data types or anything like that. You know, everything's got a corresponding data type on one side and the other side. So it was pretty straightforward, but uh, you know, it, it's really more of a, a matter of getting the content types exactly where you want them before you, you start coding everything. Sure. Um, I have a question about the workflow. But, uh, um, are, your, are the original authors actually writing in Drupal, or are they submitting they're submitting Word documents, yeah. aren't they? Okay. Yeah. I thought, <laughs> that, yeah. be, because while, while it's easy to train... We do want to get submissions. Yeah. 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 Well, while it's easy to train, you know, staff of, of the journal mm -hmm. to, to use Drupal, it's, it's not impossible to train everybody. Including, so, especially senior scholars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I, I've run a platform, an e-publishing platform for law schools mm -hmm. that um, mm -hmm. we're doing case books. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it's in WordPress, I can't mention it. So, um, but uh, yeah, we, we get like 1,000 page Word documents. We send them to Thailand and have with them. Yeah, that's what your interns are for, right? That's, yeah. Yeah. We're, we are the interns. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, I entered it in like in a browser that accidentally like closed in the window. Mm. <laughs> mm. But I mean, it, 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 we are using, um, for example, the user account that they create in submitting it. We do then draw that over um, if the piece is accepted into mm -hmm. that and things like that. Do they ever visit the site and log in at all? Or do the staff? No, I mean, do the, um, the authors? Mm -hmm. I think that, that uh, as, we, um, as we get used to using this workflow, um, that I think some of our repeat authors especially will. Um, but I mean, I think that even you know, even the authors we publish the most often is probably once a year. Um, so people come back as readers, um, but they won't really have a need to log in. I think very much. I mean, people when they have submissions under review, they'll they'll come back and check every two or three days to see how <laughs> that's going. But that's for sure. <laughs> do you ever do translations? Do we? Um, we have translated a few pieces. Uh, we don't typically, but we've had a couple of pieces that uh, the, the journal is about, um, you know, places and spaces in the U.S. South and their global connections. So pieces having to do with um, uh, uh, things like labor in the South and looking at the influx of people from Central and South America. We published some of those pieces in English and Spanish. Can you do it in We don't because, it, you know, as, as, as scholarly um, articles, we really need kind of like a, 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 someone working with the scholar to translate it and to make sure that it, it has the, you know, the same kind of... It'd, it'd be a lovely component to add to the workflow. For but sure. It's, it's so rarely used mm -hmm. for this particular journal that it would, it would need to be a, a much bigger piece of uh, distribution, honestly. Piece of uh, distribution. So about the Maestro module that you mentioned, uh, at a uh, technical level, what does it do? I see the graph that you produce as an interesting relationship, but how does it... It's not terribly straightforward, honestly, um, and a lot of work can be put into creating components that make it more straightforward. Hmm. Um, it basically sort of works in its own ecosystem where it creates its own variables and then can use those variables to act on uh, parts of, 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 a, of, of a content type. Um, the, the basic functionality out of the box is really uh, based around publishing and things like that, but you can add uh, custom functions and things like that 
uh, to extend it, which is what we've kind of done, and, and what would be a bigger part of the, the distribution if it included the workflow? Any other questions? All right, well, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, happy to present to you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>